praise the Lord and ready to go again. And Brock is going to bring to us a message, a live link today. And uh, so we're just trusting God that he's going to continue putting a whole theme together. Uh, so, Father, we just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would continue to refresh us, my God, challenge us with your word, uh, let, this, let revelation flow, uh, let understanding come. Lord, we just pray for the, uh, the liberty of your spirit, and I pray for Brock that he would just have uh, just a freedom of speech. And we put it all in your quite capable hands, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for me to start, Adam? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Adam and Tom and all the brothers and sisters for everything and um, for sure for inviting me to be a part of this again this year. I would have loved to have been there in person, but believe me, I'm there in spirit and have every intention of being there in, in the years to come. Uh, I've just had so many irons in the fire this year, wasn't able to make the trip, but um, I trust that you'll pardon me on that. And uh, so I'm going to try to share the screen here so you can see the lecture slides. All right. How's that? Can you see the slides okay? All right. So what I'd like to visit with you a little bit today about is the meaning of Christ's statement in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, uh, regarding this generation. And this has been a message that's been on my heart for several years to present to you, but um, the timing just didn't, I didn't feel the liberty and the spirit to release it. And uh, this year I felt that this was uh, timely. And so I pray that it'll be a blessing to you as it has been to me as I've uh, peered into the word of God and, and seen these things for myself. All right. Okay. So Christ's statement about this generation is found three places in the Synoptic Gospels. We see it in Matthew 24, 34, and we also see it in Mark's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel as well. And in all three places, it finds itself in the Olivet Discourse, which uh, here in our group, we, we've looked into the Olivet Discourse several times, but it's the final message that Christ gave uh, the final didactic section of, of Matthew's gospel out of the five didactic sections in the book, um, where he gives his vision of what's going to happen at the time of the end and in the days leading up to the time of the end and uh, his glorious return. And of course, he gave this the sermon right before he went to the cross. So this was at the Mount of Olives and his disciples were there with him. And he made the statement, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. This is a very pivotal verse in the Olivet Discourse for understanding the whole of the sermon and Christ's meaning. And it has, there's been a lot of ink spilled amongst commentators of all different persuasions to try to understand exactly what Christ's words mean here. And so I think it behooves us to really spend the time uh, learning what Christ really meant by this phrase. So to give you the larger context, you know, in the Olivet Discourse itself, Jesus begins by giving us an overview of end time or eschatological events, right? So he is uh, telling us about the great deception that would occur, um, how there would be wars and earthquakes and famines and pestilences and false Christs and uh, false anointings and so forth, and that there would be great tribulation upon the church. And he talks about how these things would be... Uh, would continue to increase in intensity. He describes them as the beginning of birth pains. And uh, of course, that presumes that it would continue in intensity and then end at the day of the Lord or the end of the age. In So he gives us that general overview, for example, in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 14, when he's answering the disciples' questions 
about the timing of his return and the sign of his coming. And then in verse 15 of Matthew 24, he begins to delve in more into the specifics. So he had given us the more general overview of signs earlier, which included not only the events in a general sense between his first and second advent, but also more particularly uh, as the time of, of the end approached. But here, beginning in verse 15, he gives us very particular signs about the end. And so he begins with speaking about this abomination of desolation. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into what that is, but uh, I guess uh, we should mention that it is an idol that will be put by the Antichrist and his armies in the temple of God in Jerusalem. We do adhere to a future fulfillment of, the, of that event, so we do believe uh, that it is future. And I won't defend that position today, but if you want to get more into what I've um, written about this, uh, there's some good things um, that the brothers have done. First of all, let me mention that Reggie's done a good job, uh, Reggie Kelly, on the Mystery of Israel website in the Daniel uh, convocation, where he really delves into this, and really all the convocations, defending a futurity of this, this event. And uh, I also write about it in Debunking Preterism, which uh, I would encourage you to check out if you find this topic to be interesting in uh, several places online and lectures and so forth as well. Um, but any, anyhow, uh, all commentators agree that this event known as the Abomination of Jerusalem, uh, Desolation, which will occur in Jerusalem, will begin a period of great and unprecedented tribulation, which Jesus speaks of. And then immediately after this great and unprecedented tribulation, there will be cosmic disturbances. Uh, specifically, Jesus mentions the sun darkened, the moon turned to blood, the stars falling from heaven. Other passages in the Old Testament and in the New mention um, a great and unprecedented earthquake. Uh, we're looking for a stellar darkness. We're looking for um, great turmoil and upheaval in the heavenly uh, spheres. And this, the prophets... Uh, as a whole, speak of this as the day of the Lord. So this is the day that ends the larger tribulation, great tribulation period. And it's at that time, because Jesus says immediately after the tribulation of those days, that this would happen. And then at that time, they will see the Son of Man's coming uh, with the clouds and with all of the holy angels in the authority and power of, of the Father. And at that time, it also says in Matthew's gospel and in the other synoptics that the, the angels will be sent out to gather God's elect from the, from the ends of heaven and the ends of the earth. And it's interesting that whereas Matthew talks about the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, uh, the, the other gospels speak of simply the coming of the Son of Man, or uh, which we know to be Christ's return. All right, so there is a specific order of events in the Olivet Discourse. The phrase that we're looking at today and that we're going to explore about this generation comes on the heels of that. So it's after Jesus has gone into these specific events that must occur prior to his return, uh, he talks about the parable of the fig tree, where he says that, you know, when you start to see these things, rejoice and lift up your heads because you know that his return is near and so forth. And then that's when he mentions this statement about this generation not passing away until all these things take place. So clearly, when we speak of all these things, it, it includes not only the abomination of desolation and the great tribulation, but also presupposes the cosmic stellar darkness and the return of Christ. And that creates a problem for, for many. Now, the preterist commentators, they take the position, of course, preterism is the view that uh, most of the book of Revelation happened in the past in the events surrounding the first Jewish-Roman War of AD 66 to 70, which ended with the termination of the Jewish uh, temple and the nation as a whole, and eventually led to the Second War, which uh, created a large dispersion of Jews throughout the known world, which has largely continued until the 20th century. So preterists argue that almost the entirety of Revelation, or the entirety, depending on which preterist you talk to, was fulfilled during that time and is not speaking of future events. They would also include in their argument um, most, if not all, of the Olivet Discourse as having been fulfilled in the past. So what's the relevance for that? Well, the relevance is that for those with this position, they argue that when Jesus said that this generation will not pat, uh, pass away till all these things take place, 
that that not only referred to the destruction of the temple and the tribulation surrounding Jerusalem, but also uh, the coming of the Son of Man uh, with the clouds. And so um, most preterists take the position that the coming of the Son of Man is not about the return of Christ, which is, the, of course, the historic position of the church, but is speaking about a spiritual coming or a judgment coming on Jerusalem. Obviously, that's a very different interpretation than the futurist interpretation held by uh, all the fathers of the church and, of course, by our group as well, that it's speaking of Jesus's return. Um, the preterists will argue that this generation is speaking about a time period and that all those prophetic events had to happen in the past. Now, there is a middle position taken by G.K. Beale, um, uh, D.A. Carson, and many, many other academics who teach that the abomination of desolation happened with respect to the destruction of the Second Temple in AD 70, and that the Great Tribulation is an extended period of basically the entirety of Christian history that will end in the future return of Jesus. So that middle position is fraught with difficulties, um, not to mention that they distract from the Judeo-centricity of the tribulation. In other words, that Jesus was speaking about a large tribulation that had its epicenter in Jerusalem and presumably would continue with a Judaic-centered tribulation until the end of the age. Um, it also separates Jesus's words from the prophecies of Daniel in terms of theme, which we'll get to later. And it also um, uh, creates several other difficulties related to the destruction of the temple, which we'll see. Uh, not the least of which, as Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things take place, which even if you argue that the, all these things does not include the coming of the Son of Man, it certainly includes the cosmic darkness uh, of the day of the Lord, which we know from the other scriptures happens at the return of Christ Jesus. Okay. All right. So the preterists will argue that when Jesus talked about this generation, that uh, throughout the Synoptic Gospels, that he was speaking to the people there, his contemporaries. And according to these preterists, uh, therefore, um, because it included those people, it was limited to those people. And I would argue that's the fallacy. These scribes and Pharisees and those that Jesus was speaking to were certainly included in this generation, but the phrase itself is not, uh, uh, it does not exclude people outside of Jesus' contemporary time. We have to understand that. Um, so when we look at the phrase, when we look at the word generation in modern English, um, this is according to the Oxford Learner's Dictionary, uh, the primary meaning of generation now is all people who were born at about the same time, and the secondary but closely related definition is the average time in which children grow up, become adults, and have children of their own, so it's usually about 30 years or so. And so the preterist argues, you know, that, that the Jerusalem temple, the second temple was destroyed uh, less than 40 years after the Olivet Discourse was given, and therefore uh, generation refers to a chronological period or uh, a contemporary group of people, okay? So it's consistent with more of the modern English. However, there's um, several problems, as we're going to see today with that view. This is a very important point. These are not the primary meanings of the Greek word generation or genea in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay, so today in this lecture, I'm going to demonstrate that from the scripture uh, conclusively, I hope, for you, so that you can see what exactly Jesus had in mind when he spoke about generation. All right, so we'll start with the phrase, hey, genea ate, or this generation, okay, and how it's used in the New Testament. So the phrase itself appears several times uh, in Matthew's gospel, uh, twice in Mark, and several times in Luke's gospel as well. What I want you to notice is that Jesus' use of this generation is not limited to the words this generation. He uses genea in a, in a, um, a broader sense when he adds adjectives to it, like as what we see here below in the slide. So these adjectival constructions uh, help us understand which generation Jesus has in mind. Notice what he says here. In Mark 9, 19, he says, O faithless generation. Elsewhere, he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation. So notice the pejorative adjectives. It's always a negative slant on who this generation is. It's this wicked generation, an evil and adulterous generation, uh, an evil generation, and this adulterous and sinful generation, okay? So every time when Jesus uses Ganea, he's speaking about 
using it in a very negative, pejorative, uh, wicked uh, sense. And that's uh, the, the first point. Elsewhere, to be complete, uh, Peter uses this perverse generation in Acts 2 on his sermon there after Pentecost, right? Because he's giving, he's telling the people, be saved from this perverse generation, uh, which presumes that they need to come out of it and be saved from it uh, and be separate from it, okay? Something you can't do with a time period or uh, even for those all living at the same time. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about a crooked and perverse generation. So you can see that both Peter and Paul are picking up on the language of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels. And the Philippians passage is unique in that he's writing primarily to a, a largely Gentile church when he says you need to be as light shining in a crooked and perverse generation, right? So he, he's calling them out of this generation. And he's using that same language. But it's interesting because um, this is a proof text that helps us understand that whatever the sinful generation is, it's not an ethnic or racial uh, saying, but rather it speaks to humanity in a larger sense. Um, if the Jew is, uh, as a corporate body, is in sin, how much more wicked would the Gentile world be? Okay, we need to understand that. But Paul and Peter are calling them, whether Jew or Gentile, to come out of this wicked generation, okay? Um, clearly, Jesus did not include himself in this wicked generation, okay? Now, generation or genea in the synoptic gospels has a technical meaning, okay? And this is actually a key to understanding what I'm saying today. Generation in biblical terms means that which is produced as offspring or children, Okay, it's a type or character of people or children. Um, Gerhard Kittel in his Theological Dictionary of the New Testament correctly notes that the general usage of generation or genea means birth or descent. The word has a primary meaning of offspring or children who are sired, produced, brought out of, generated, or come forth from. Okay, so generation in a biblical sense, I would argue, always has this idea of coming forth from the parents, okay, um, an offspring or child. The secondary sense is that pejorative language that we already saw, the iniquity or the evil that is produced as a result of that parental heritage. Okay, so let's delve in a little bit, and I'll make the case for this for you, and uh, you can see what your thoughts are. Uh, first thing I think is important is Jesus borrowed his concept about this generation from the Song of Moses. Jesus, in a long line of the prophets, being the prophet exemplar and uh, uh, the one to whom all the prophets longed for, uh, remember, also was the lawgiver. He was there on Mount Sinai. He was in the burning bush. Um, he is the Alpha and the Omega. So he not only gave the law and interprets the law, but Moses himself was the one who first spoke about this perverse and crooked generation. Okay. Now, when we talk about Moses' Song of Moses, there's two Songs of Moses, but in the strictest sense, we're talking about not the Song of Moses that was given after the Red Sea was split, but we're talking about the Song of Moses at the end of, the Deut at the end of Deuteronomy, at the end of the Torah, in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And in this song, uh, which we'll, I'll talk about uh, more in a minute, um, the preamble for that's in chapter 31, and there's even some introduction in chapter 30. Uh, let's delve into the text, and then I'll give you more of a background for the Song of Moses. Uh, Moses is teaching the children this song, and in verse 5, he says, They, that is, the children of Israel, have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? And then down to verse 18 of the rock, that is God who begot you. Notice that begatting, that, that language of father and child. You were unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. So you can see that the language that Jesus used came right out of this text, okay? Now, granted, the eschatology or the end times prophecies of the Torah, we also see in Genesis 49 with Jacob's blessing. We see in um, 
Balaam gave an end times prophecy in Numbers 23 and 24, the pagan uh, who the Lord used as a mouthpiece. And But this is really the bedrock. I would argue that the Song of Moses is the bedrock for all end time prophecy in the entire Bible. And it's, it's fitting that it finds itself at, situated at the end of the Torah, right before you know the rest of the prophets. So the rest of the prophets then in that prophetic lineage of Moses, they hang their understanding of the end times on this song. That's how pivotal and important it is. So it makes sense then that the prophets and Jesus as well would then pick up on this language of Moses, this uh, perverse and crooked generation. We see it throughout the prophets, different derivatives of it. We find it most poignantly in Isaiah chapter one, when Isaiah gives his introduction, his theme text for the rest of the book of Isaiah. Okay, so we see that, uh, first of all, in the larger context of the song, why are the children of Israel a perverse and crooked generation? Moses tells us, okay, he says that the nation uh, had become idolatrous. And not only had they become idolatrous, they were inherently idolatrous, right? I'm not talking about every individual, nor Mo, that's not what Moses had in mind. He was saying corporately, collectively, as a nation, the nation was sinful from its inception. We see this um, not only in the story of the patriarchs, but in Moses' own day, when he, he left for just a short time, came down, uh, you know, just weeks later after having ascended into the cloud. And when he returned from the clouds of glory, what happened? They had already had the golden calf experience with Aaron, of all people, right? And the nation was involved with idolatry shortly thereafter with Baal of Peor and on and on the story goes. And so as you read through the Tanakh, through the prophets, what do we see? Idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. And this was provoking the Lord to jealousy because God had betrothed and has betrothed and will continue to betroth this nation eternally as his people. But the nation has committed adultery and has been wayward and crooked in their ways, perverted in their ways. And as a result, they've turned to idolatry. And that will continue, of course, as we know from other scriptures, and we'll see later, um, until the Lord returns. Now, God has always preserved a faithful remnant of his people. He has always called out people unto himself and regenerated them by the Holy Spirit. And that's no less true in Moses' day, Abraham's day, in the days of the prophets, in the days of Jesus, as it is today. God has always preserved a remnant of people within the larger nation who are not part of this wicked and corrupt generation. And of course, Moses was one of them. All right, so to give you a little backdrop for the song, um, we see a crescendo in um, this idolatry. Yes, in one sense, Moses has in mind the people before him. But remember, the, the people that he is speaking to, that he originally delivered the song to, was not the first generation of Israelites who came out of the desert. This is at the end of Deuteronomy, right before Moses' death, where he himself is challenging the children of the original parentage, okay? So these are the, the righteous children. I mean, there are many righteous among them, at least, who were the second generations who were going into the land under the leadership of Joshua, okay? But Moses says this in Deuteronomy 31, 21. So this is the chapter before of the Song of Moses. He says, well, actually, it's the Lord. He says, for I, the Lord, know the inclination of their behavior, okay? And in 31, verse 27, he says, for I, this is Moses speaking, I know your rebellion and your stiff neck, speaking to the people. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? So this perversity of this generation will worsen. Okay, so we're seeing a crescendo of idolatry. And then in the song itself, in verse 29, Moses says, for I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt. And turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you when? In the latter days. Okay? There's a climax in the latter days to this crescendo. Because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. We also see in verse 29, it's, it's their latter end. And oh, that they would perceive their latter end, that they might gain wisdom in these days. And so the song itself wasn't for the wilderness generation or the second generation. It was for that trans-historical period, beginning with Israel's inception until she reaches glory, okay? And so the latter days is, is just as important for this generation as Moses' time period. 
What is the resolution to this generation? He tells us in Deuteronomy 4, the beginning bookend, where he says, where the prophet connected this time period of uh, with Israel's tribulation, ultimately leading to a national repentance, when? In the latter days. We can also see this in Jeremiah 5.19. So the new covenant promise that we see in places like Deuteronomy 30, just a few chapters before this, um, is that the nation will return to God, mercifully receive a spiritual circumcision, an inward of the heart, an event that will occur when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse. We see that in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 and following. So all these things will come upon you, the blessing and the curse, okay? Um, okay, let's see, Jesus. Yeah, I know you're still, yeah. Tom was just letting me know that you're still seeing that original slide, and I, I know that. We just haven't moved forward yet. Um, so the all these things finds its initial, that phrase finds its um, initial um, foundation even in Moses' own words here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, just two chapters before this. So it finds its resolution at the time of the end, at the return of Christ, after the tribulation, when the nation reaches that place of spiritual circumcision, which they have not yet reached, and are really unable to, because they don't yet have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Okay, so Tom, I'm going to move on to the next slide, if I, if I can. Let's see. There we go. Notice in red, I put here, uh, I highlighted the parts of this song that talk about the fatherhood of God and the, the, uh, the childhood of the children of Israel, okay? Notice it says they are not as children. Now, this doesn't mean that they are, this is probably using um, hyperbole, okay? But those, we got to keep in mind, though, being of the ethnicity of Abraham does not guarantee one's salvation. It's only the gospel that brings a person to, to uh, glory. And so apart from regeneration, see, we use that word generation, apart from regeneration uh, by the spirit from heaven, where God is truly one's father, apart from that, no one can be saved. And so in, in a very real sense, the vast majority of people are not uh, of the nation are not God's children. They're a perverse and crooked generation. And it asks the question, is he not your father? Has he not made you? Has he not begotten you? He's the God who fathered you. So we see generation being used in context as coming forth from the parent, okay? The sons and daughterhood of God and children in whom is no faith. Notice that last verse. They're a perverse generation. Then he defines what that means. Children, okay? Offspring, if you will, in whom is no faith. All right, in blue here, I have, I just show the pejorative sense in, uh, of the context, right? The corruption, their blemish, the perverseness, crookedness, foolishness, lack of wisdom, how they're unmindful and have forgotten God, perversity, and lack of faith, okay? So we see that coming forth from God means one thing, and being begotten from the Spirit, but being begotten from another, you know, through idolatry, not having... Um, the the covenantal fidelity with God as as husband that his bride had become like a harlot an adulterous harlot and therefore uh was had another father God was not the father of those who rejected him and spurned his ways okay although that corporate calling for the nation of Israel is forever as Paul tells us in in Romans chapters 9 through 11 okay so this slide, uh, this is a viper. I think it's a Palestinian viper, which is uh, likely what Moses and the prophets had in mind when they talked about the deadly uh, venom of the bite from these vipers. Okay, this was a this was one animal you did not want to uh, find when you reach under a log. Okay, this was, um, but notice in the Song of Moses, and I brought it here to your, to your view. Um, in verses 32 and 33 of the Song of Moses, he says, speaking of the children of Israel, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. Of course, the backdrop of this, uh, the Hebrew reader would have understood Genesis 3 and the serpent and the fall in the beginning would be the backdrop for um, not just any old viper, but that that would be the biblical genesis, if you will, of 
what he means by the cruelty of cobras and serpents, okay? The children of Israel collectively as a whole uh, had been venomously bitten by the serpent. And so the evil that exuded um, in this idolatry that we see inherent throughout the nation's history uh, is because of a paternity that finds its origin in Genesis chapter three with the serpent. Okay, again, we're not talking about everyone in the nation. We're talking about the um, the larger part of the nation, and we're talking about uh, this is not an ethnic thing or a racial thing. Um, if it's true of Israel, how much more true is it of the nations? And I think that's important that we don't misunderstand uh, that this is not talking about a a ethnic uh, generation. This is a spiritual generation. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah picks up on the Song of Moses, and he says, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Here it is, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. And we see the language of corruption again. Um, in Isaiah chapter 1, we see Isaiah saying, Hear, O heavens, and hear, O earth. Right? He is quoting the Song of Moses, where Moses says essentially the same thing. There are lots of thematic similarities with Isaiah chapter 1, and really throughout the whole of the prophets where they use the Song of Moses as their foundation stone to then go into other eschatological ideas. But notice the brood of evildoers is there as well. And in Numbers 32, we see another uh, verse about it. And look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. So God's wrath is coming down on the, the larger nation because the children were standing in the stead of their fathers. They were doing the same thing their fathers were doing. This brood of sinful men was no different with the children than it was the fathers. So this generation comes because it's being it's come, because they're just like their fathers. So generation has to do with parentage. Okay. The final one I want to point to your attention is Isaiah chapter fourteen, the the loose Lucifer passage where Lucifer. Uh, the the king of Babylon falls from his heavenly heights where his throne is with all the angelic uh, hosts of heaven. And we know, of course, Jesus alludes to this when he speaks of Satan falling from heaven. Um, here it says, you, Lucifer, will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and you've slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Okay, so we see the brood of evildoers are those who are a part and parcel of Lucifer, okay? All right. Um, Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 speaks to the Pharisees and Sadducees like he does many times throughout the synoptics and throughout the Gospels as a whole. And notice what he says here in verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. So notice from the tree comes the fruit. The fruit is a reflection of the tree, the substance of the person, the works and the reflection come out of that tree, whether good or bad. So we see the dichotomy between the two uh, generations. And notice verse 34, brood of vipers, he tells them. There's that language of the Song of Moses. How can you being evil speak good things? The implication is you can't. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So notice the uh, the um, the apocalyptic dichotomy between the two trees, the two types of people coming forth from the fathers to the children. And Jesus picks up on this in the third, or the John the Baptist picks up on this in Matthew chapter three. He says, "Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That is to say, the wrath at the day of the Lord." Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Okay, and there's a play on words there with the word stones, but notice the, that we're talking about the fathers and the children, the generation that comes forth from the fathers. Okay, and it's not sufficient to be an ethnic descendant of Abraham. One has to be a spiritual descendant of Abraham to inherit the promises given to Abraham and to his seed, as Reggie mentioned in, in earlier uh, in his message. All right, so Matthew 23 is a very important passage when we're exploring what Jesus meant in Matthew 24 in the next chapter. Why? Because it forms theological bookends. Notice the underlying words here where Jesus says, all these things will come upon this generation. 
that should ring a bell in our ears that this is the same language of Matthew 24, 34 that we're looking at today. Why? Because the way that Matthew constructed the gospel here, this portion of the gospel, is to give us the theological introduction and the theological conclusion, although it's not quite at the end of the discourse. And everything in between that sandwich is about this. That's how important this theme verse is, okay? So let's look at the content of that passage. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the scribes and Pharisees here in the beginning of verse 31. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. So he's talking about those that he's going to send in the, in the apostolic period. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and you'll persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, that is in the very beginning, right? To the blood of Zechariah. So this is the end of the biblical period. Son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, this is key. Jesus is saying, you scribes and Pharisees, what happened in the very beginning when the serpent first tempted the man and the woman unto sin, leading to what? Cain's murder of Abel, the very first martyr of the gospel, right? From that very martyrdom, all the way through biblical history, all of the martyred prophets and saints and holy people of God, that blood is on you. Okay, God is not saying that the people that Jesus is speaking to, the scribes and Pharisees, are going to receive the wrath, that they alone are going to receive the wrath of things done by other people in ancient times. God holds us accountable for what we do in our time. But the point here that he's saying is this generation is a trans-historical generation. It's a generation that has been since the beginning, like father, like son, like father, like son, like father, like son. There's a broken, unbroken chain from the beginning of the serpent's inception of sin that you are, are ratifying by your behavior, by your rejection of Christ, by your rejection of the prophets. And so he's saying, fill up the measure of their guilt so that when wrath comes, it comes upon the entirety of this generation, of this type of offspring, these people, okay? And notice, um, notice also that he says... Uh, all these things, okay? So that includes all the wrath of God. All right, here in blue, I highlighted serpents, brood of vipers, because I just want to illustrate, again, we're seeing that brood of vipers language, going back to Genesis chapter 3, and of course, to the Song of Moses, more specifically. And in red, notice he says, you're the sons of those who murdered the prophets, so like father, like son. And he says, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Why? So that you're, the wrath that God brings upon you is justified. It's justified because you have filled up within yourselves the very measure that they filled up in their time period, okay? And I'll prove that in a minute, why it must mean that. And notice I underlined, fill up then the measure of their guilt. We're going to see this language again in the Thessalonian letters, okay? And then in verse 35, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, okay? And I, I discussed this a little bit, uh, this golden chain, this unbroken chain. When will that end? According to Matthew 23, what does Jesus say? First, he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. So the destruction of the second temple in AD 70 is emblematic of the type of wrath that already exists, okay? How do we know it already exists? Romans chapter 1 tells us, for example, by letting, by God releasing people to do as their free will chooses to do unto iniquity, they actually are receiving the wrath of God in the, pro the process of their iniquity. They don't have to wait for the judgment day at the end, which is coming and will happen as well, but it's already inherent within the wicked. It's our judgment is already here, just like judgment has already passed us and the wrath of God has been satisfied for those that know Christ, okay? Judgment has happened. But here, notice Jesus says, see your house is left to you desolate. Here's a sign. For I say to you, you shall, know, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a glorious passage. I think it's from uh, Psalm, I think it's 119. It's one of the Hillel Psalms that's sung by all Jews, always has been from their inception since the Psalms were written. 
Um, and it was sung for all the high holidays, okay? So including Passover, where Jesus went to the cross, right? But he says, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the passage is about Yahweh's return to his people, his covenant faithfulness to the nation, that he will redeem the nation. He will bring the Jewish nation to a fullness and to a salvific relationship with himself. He has not abandoned her and will never abandon her. Um, and that he will have mercy in that day. But notice it's it's messianic as well. If you go back and you read the psalm, you can see it's a, it's it's messianic. And it's ultimately about Jesus's return when he comes back, that the nation will be able to exclaim, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus says that the wrath of God will be on this generation until when? Until that generation disappears at the day of the Lord, when they say, blessed is he who comes. That day has not happened yet, folks. This is the glorious return. This is our blessed hope. We all will say this on that day, I pray. So when we talk about this generation as being a trans-historical generation, we talked about filling up the measure of wrath and sins and guilt and so forth. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2.16, where Paul, in the context, is talking about the Jews, particularly in Judea, who had rejected the gospel and were going around the empire, following the apostles around, persecuting them. He says, as always, you fill up, they fill up the measure of their sins. Notice the phrase, as always. He doesn't say they're finally filling it up. They're about to fill it up. They're going to by AD 70. No, 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 no. As always, the corporate nation, the larger nation, not the elect within the nation, not the believing remnant, but the larger nation always, always fill up the measure of their sins. So it's not something that happened just before the destruction of the second temple. Okay. In Acts chapter seven, we see a the preaching of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And right before he was killed by this generation, he cried out, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Not just now, not just, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So there's the generational um, replication of whatever this uh, proclivity or um, inherent sin is. Okay, we do know it's a proclivity, it's a uh, ancestral sin we use in theological parlance, but we're talking about a sinful disposition, which, of course, we know theologically comes from where? It comes from our fathers. It comes from Adam and Eve when they took of the fruit and disobeyed God in the beginning. That ancestral um, disposition has continued with us as a flaw in our nature um, until we are redeemed and found in Christ. And then there's a battle, okay, until the war is won. Sorry uh, to uh, retreat there. Verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, that is Christ, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And we know from Acts chapter 3 that it's not just the rulers. It's not just the scribes and the Pharisees that are a part of this generation. It's also the people. The people were culpable for the rejection of Yahweh on the cross, okay, which is the, the ultimate expression of the idolatrous rejection of Yahweh throughout all time, in this age at least, okay? So there is a corporate solidarity we see here, like father, like son. Because they were regenerated from their fathers, they inherited the ancestral sin, and therefore they refused of their own will to repent, short of, of course, the circumcision that God gives to his elect. All right. Take a few seconds. All right. So we see throughout scripture, this dichotomy that I mentioned before of the two trees, the two seeds, the two, you know, we see it most particularly in the book of Genesis, but we see it woven throughout the entirety of scripture, finding its uh, resolution in the book of Revelation. In John's gospel, where Jesus confronts the scribes and the Pharisees in John chapter 8, he says this. He says, and sorry for the long, uh, for the length of this, but I, I want you to get the full picture of what Jesus says to them. He goes, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. So there's Father God and Father the serpent. Okay, the dichotomy. They answered and said to him, Abraham's our father. And he said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 
but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Of course, who's that, right? They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one God. We have one father, God. But the problem with that, of course, is they're poking at Jesus because they understood the rumors about him being born of a virgin. So they're poking at his own paternity. Where are you really from? Who really is your father? Which, of course, is half of the theme of John's gospel. The where did you come from? And, of course, where are you going? Verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. See that? Jesus is generated from the father. He's eternally generated. He had no beginning. He's eternally generated and will be generated throughout all eternity from the Father as the second person of the all-holy trinity. So he comes from God, and then he says, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. And so Jesus, being always generated from the Father, was never generated of the serpent. And Reggie touched on this in his uh, message about um, where he was speaking of, of the generation and how um, well, I won't, I won't, I won't rehash his, but it was very good. I, if you haven't listened to it, definitely go back and listen to it. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. They're not even able. You are of your father, the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. So they're coming forth from the father as a wicked generation. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? And here's the key. It's of God or from God, that is to say Jesus, and by extension, us who are in Christ. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear. Why? Because you are not from God. God. Where are you from? Your father, the serpent. So there's two seeds, those who are in Christ and those who are in the serpent. And this isn't just true of Israel. This is certainly true of the nations as well. Because this generation and the generation of the righteous are two generations. Where do we first see the two generations? We see it in Genesis 3 of all places, in what we what scholars call the proto-evangelion or the first proclamation of the good news of the gospel there we see the lord speaking to the serpent after he tempted adam and eve to sin and he says and i the lord will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel this is the first proclamation of the gospel in its embryonic stage, right here in Genesis 3 of all places, right where the fall happened, because redemption was planned by God and purposed by God and available from God from the beginning. But notice what he says. He said there's a seed of the serpent and there's a seed of woman. Yes, there's the serpent and the woman. They will always be at enmity. Why? Because man will always be in a war with the serpent, with the devil. But there's more. They have seed as well. They have offspring. They have generation. They're issuing forth a people. And there's the people of the serpent, and there's the people of the woman. The seed of the serpent has both a corporate and individual sense, and the seed of the woman has both a corporate and an individual sense. What do I mean? Yes, we're not just talking about, you know, serpents biting the heel of, of people and, you know, spreading their, their venom, which then kills the person that they bite. That's the... That's the um, that's the cultural backdrop, but the meaning of the verse is clearly something so much more. Um, what is implied here in the verse is that the seed of the woman would have a heel pierced by the, the fangs of the serpent, presumably unto death, right? Because uh, this was implicit, and it's implicit in the text, but it's even more explicit in the suffering servant passage of Isaiah 53, and uh, we see the idea of the heel being grasped by in the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Where eventually Jacob's name, the, the heel or deceiver becomes Israel, those who strive with God and prevail. But we also see it in Zechariah's prophecy where the nation of Israel will look at the returning Jesus and they will see him, Yahweh, me, the one that they have pierced. So we know that the seed of the woman ultimately points to the Messiah who would be pierced by the venomous serpent. And we know at the cross, of course, he received deadly wounds, not only to his hands, but also to his heel. 
And notice it says that that's not the end of the story because the wounded victor would certainly be victorious because he is going to crush or bruise the head of the serpent, which is implicit there that he would kill the head of the serpent. And of course, we see that this deadly serpent's wound we see in the book of Revelation as well, which I'll get to in a moment. So we have the corporate seed of the woman and the individual seed of the woman. The individual seed of the woman is Christ, and those who are in Christ by faith believing and trusting in him are the corporate seed of Christ that have come out of this generation. They're the called out ones, the ecclesia who have left, saved themselves from this perverse and crooked generation. And then you have the corporate seed of the serpent, which are those who are in Adam, who are who then was in the serpent because he received a deadly wound through sin and death in the from the beginning when he disobeyed and transgressed. But we also, just as we saw an individual seed of the woman, we also see in scripture the individual seed of the serpent. Just as God himself took upon human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and became a generated in time and space, a generated vessel of humanity, although without sin, without the proclivities of sin, without the seed of the serpent being a part of who he is, being impossible to be overtaken by sin. But the seed of the serpent, that collective seed, will also take an incarnational form. The serpent himself will become incarnate in this man that we now call the Antichrist. The Christ and the Antichrist are antithetical to one another, finding their, uh, their corporate fullness in those individuals. And we know from the book of Revelation that that Antichrist will receive a mortal wound in one of his heads. That's Genesis 3.15. And we also know that he, he also will parody Christ's resurrection from the dead when he has a resurrection unto death, when his mortal wound is healed, and all the world marvels and said, who is able to be like the beast? Who can wage war against him? And of course, we know the end of the story, that the wounded victor comes from heaven with clouds. And what's he do? With a word, with the breath of his lips, he puts an end to the serpent's seed. Okay? So what do we see? All's to say... The seed of the woman and the seed of the servant have both, both corporate and individual um, manifestations or revelations. The revelation of iniquity in the man of sin and the revelation of godliness in the Messiah. This, folks, is the cosmic struggle that finds its fulfillment in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the eschatological crux of the gospel. All right. So... This is uh, an important book. If you're not able to get it, uh, it's, it can be expensive. I've seen it really expensive at times on online, but if it becomes uh, more affordable, I would encourage you to buy it. It's well worth it. Uh, Evald Lovenstam wrote uh, Jesus in this generation, and um, he uh, does a masterful job at going through the Gospels and through the New Testament and demonstrating what Jesus means when he talks about this generation. Okay, and it's consistent with what I just presented today. Um, there are other works that are good too, but this one is sort of the uh, theological. Um, um, this is really the magnum opus on 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 this topic. If you want further research, uh, Lovenstam points out that this generation, how it's used in the New Testament, that there's an there are actually themes that show up again and again and again repetitively every time Jesus speaks about this generation. And so he uses this, and he he uses this to demonstrate what Jesus means when he says this generation, okay? We see this language used in the demand for a sign from Jesus. We see it in the parable of the playing children, the healing of the epileptic boy, the eschatological sayings about this generation, the judgment, the final judgment on this generation, and of course, what we're looking at today in the Olivet Discourse. To be complete, Lovenstam also demonstrates how Peter uses this language, the Apostle Peter, on his appeal on the day of Pentecost, right, which we saw earlier in, in today's lecture. And also there's a few epistolary uh, references. We see Paul, which I mentioned in Philippians 2, and also which we're going to look at in a minute, uh, Hebrews chapter 3. What are those repeated themes or elements in these pericopes? Well, number one. The expression this generation always has a negative tone, and it refers to people characterized by moral wickedness, as, we, as we've seen. Number two, 
God repeatedly sends preachers to this generation to proclaim a message of repentance. So he sends the prophets, he sends the Old Testament ones, he sends John the Baptist, he sends, he himself comes, um, in the son of God. And then afterwards, he says he will send uh, scribes and others. So we see this trans-historical uh, preaching of the gospel through these messengers who are not part of this generation, by the way. They're calling to this generation, proclaiming a message of repentance. Number three, this message is accompanied by miraculous signs. Yet this generation reacts with doubt and disbelief. Number four, this generation persecutes and often kills God's righteous messengers that God sent to her. Number five, this generation will be condemned on judgment day, but the righteous messengers and those who are saved from the generation will be vindicated and receive rewards. And finally, number six, the New Testament links this pattern of rejecting the sent ones with similar narratives in the Old Testament. So they're constantly drawing on Old Testament motifs to demonstrate that this is nothing new, like they, like back then, now, right? It's the same. In fact, in some ways, um, you know, Jesus's contemporaries were worse in many ways than the previous, because there were those who left this generation and did indeed repent. So this is key as well. This generation in the synoptics does not include Christ and his disciples. Now, granted, there is a place where Jesus seems to lump his disciples with this generation when they have doubt and unbelief in the early part of his ministry, okay? But through the process of Jesus uh, discipling his disciples, they are clearly not at some point part of this generation. And on the day of Pentecost, they have no part in this generation. They, are, they have fled from this, uh, this the sinfulness of this generation. So to be complete, let's look at some other passages that will drive home the point of what we mean by this generation, okay? In the Old Testament, we see the phrase, this generation, only used twice in the Septuagint, in, um, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, okay? We see it in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, with the generation of the flood. He says, the Lord says to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me. In this generation. So God is calling Noah out from this generation because he's righteous. He's calling him out into the ark of safety where the floodwaters then will destroy the wicked generation. Okay. The, the generation was destroyed because of their wickedness. So we see it there. They had become corrupt. They'd become uh, violent and they had become evil. Uh, the text tells us. And so he destroyed that entire, that I shouldn't even use the word that because he never does. He uses this generation. Notice in Psalm 12, 7 is the other, the other passage, and we see a lesser use in uh, Psalm 71, 18. He says, you shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. So clearly the righteous are not part of this generation. They are being taken from it. They are out. They live amongst this generation, but they live amongst them as lights. They are not to be part of this generation. They are called out, and God protects and preserves his people from this generation forever. Um, it is of note that there are some academic works that point out the thematic similarities between these two verses, between Genesis 7-1 and between Psalm 12-7, demonstrating they both use the same adjectives to describe this generation. Clearly, the psalmist has in mind the words given to Noah in Genesis 7-1. Okay, uh, we see similar language where clearly it's referring to this generation in other places in the Old Testament. For example, at the beginning of Deuteronomy, we see a, another portion of the theme of the book in the introduction, where it is said, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers. Now notice, um, he uses the, the proximal um, uh, this. In other words, it's not that, it's this evil generation. And he's speaking of the wilderness generation, the desert wandering generation, but it is not limited to that. There's a mystery here that I think you're starting to see, I hope, at this point. But the generation of the wilderness is like the generation of Noah, is like the generation of Jesus. They're all the same generation. They're tethered as part and parcel of the same generation that goes back to the serpent. Notice what the writer of Hebrews in this, which is a, a Pauline book, um, um, if not written by Paul, certainly by Paul's emissary uh, uh, or one of his uh, one of his scribes. 
He says, therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they uh, have not known my ways. Now, this is really fascinating because guess what the Greek text says? Do you think it says that generation or do you think it says something else? Surprise, right? It's this generation. The translators uh, wanted to bring clarity to the language, so they actually changed the wording from this generation to that generation be- so as to um, for the reader to understand that the writer of Hebrews had in mind the, the wilderness generation. But we know that it's better to use this generation because that's what the inspired text says, number one, and number two, because this generation has not ended yet. Okay? So they actually brought some obscurity to the passage, I would argue, by using the distal instead of the proximal term here. All right. Now, in the Hebrew language, it's the word door for generation. But like I mentioned earlier, it comes across in the, in the Septuagint as ganea, which is the same word that Jesus used in uh, the New Testament. Okay. Notice that there's another generation, the generation of the righteous. We see this in Psalm 14, verse 5 the generation of his fathers in Psalm 49, the generation of your children in Psalm 73, and the generation of the upright in Psalm 112. So the psalmist quite frequently uses generation to describe a characterization or type of people, an offspring of uh, righteousness or an offspring of wickedness, right? As the case may be. Notice in the suffering servant passage that Reggie alluded to earlier, the suffering servant passage of Isaiah 53, verse 8 says this, speaking of the Messiah, um, which he calls Jacob in the passage, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? So see the language, for he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Now, what does Isaiah mean here when he says, who will declare his generation? Because he said in the first verse, you know, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, right? It's in the person of Jesus in his incarnation and his ultimately his work of the passion that brings salvation to mankind. It was a mystery hidden in old times, but in new covenant times or in the New Testament, if you will, in the apostolic era, we now it's been revealed to us through the apostles that Jesus is the Messiah, and we have a revelation of the mystery that was hidden in times past, right? In the gospel, we now know that Jesus was cut off on the cross, that he is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He's God and man, fully God, fully man, God from from time immemorial to time immemorial, and man temporally and in space, right? When he became, uh, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, when he was conceived in her womb. But this man, this incarnated man, who is also God, died for the sins of the world. So if he is cut off from the land of the living, who's going to declare his generation? You don't have a generation when you're dead. You can't have offspring and be the father of the nation, the almighty God, everlasting father of, you know, father of eternity. You cannot be that if you can't have children because you've been cut off. So it presupposes that this cutoff Messiah would also be resurrected after he had made sins for iniquity. And through his resurrection, what does Isaiah 53 tell us in the immediate context? He will see his seed. He will see his offspring. Throughout Isaiah's book, offspring and seed is used in, the, in throughout as the offspring of Yahweh, the seed of Yahweh, the people of Israel, the true regenerate nation, the Jewish nation that has come to faith and by him by way of application, the Gentiles also who have been grafted in to that to that Israel of God, right? And, and that people of God are the generation of Yahweh. And we see in Isaiah 54, 1 and following, we see that generation rejoicing in the new Jerusalem. So who will declare his generation? Well, he's going to be resurrected. And uh, we, as the people of God, declare his generation. Amen? Jeremiah tells us, in vain I have chastened your children. They received no correction. O generation, see the word of the Lord. So Jeremiah is pleading with the generation of wickedness to see the word. See and hear, my people. Open your hearts. And of course, Christ will do indeed that. So we see other examples in the New Testament of generation, of Ganea. Uh, Luke 16.8 stands out. 
So the master, this is Jesus. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons, there's the children, for the children of this world are more shrewd in their generation, or if you will, towards their generation than the sons of light. Um, again, being used in the same type of way that I've been discussing. I want you to pay attention to 1 Peter 2.9. This is key. Now, Peter is quoting uh, the Old Testament, the promise given to Israel, the true Israel of God. And what does he say? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, right? There's a the language of Hosea, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy, okay? In Christ Jesus, he is speaking of the church as the chosen generation. Now, primarily, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, which is appropriate, because the covenantal promises are given to Israel. The church has received them uh, by the spirit that raised the Jewish Messiah from the dead, the same spirit that is regenerating and will regenerate the Jewish nation as a nation, I might add, not just as a, a remnant, but also as a nation from the promises. So he is calling the Christians a chosen generation. Why? What have we received? Peter tells us. We have received, um, we've received sonship, but notice he says you are partakers, you are partakers of the glory of God himself. You're partakers of the divine glory. So by being partakers of his of his substance, by the spirit, we have been, ready for this, regenerated. We are a generation of holiness because we have been, because the Father on high has made us what? His children, so that we are no more slaves. We've been bought with a price. Um, for completeness, uh, I've read the recently read through the Anti-Nicene Fathers, and there it's just I wouldn't I wouldn't put that burden on anybody, even scholars. But there are some gems in there, and there's a few I wanted to share with you because in the second and third centuries, the fathers understood generation the way I am uh, presenting it today, and the way the scriptures are clear. Uh, for example, Justin Martyr says this. Isaiah then asserted in regard to the generation of Christ that it could not be declared by man. That's Isaiah 53, 8, right, which we looked at before. The spirit of prophecy thus affirmed that the generation of him who was to die, that we sinful men might be healed by his stripes, was such as could not be declared. And then he goes on to quote right after that Isaiah's virgin birth prophecy, which we see the Emmanuel prophecy where Isaiah says, of course, it's seven, but also we see um, uh, um, it continues on into chapter nine, but we see um, that Jesus, that the Messiah will be God, right? And we see this virgin birth prophecy. Behold, she who is with child, uh, or she, the virgin will give birth to a child, and we should call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. But it's very fascinating here because Justin Martyr doesn't interpret generation the exact same way that we did contextually, but he seems to have a, a little bit of a, a different take on it. Um, but it's interesting what he does because he sees in the humanity of Jesus that he has been generated from the Theotokos, from, from the, his virgin birth, he became man. And therefore, he had a generation that began and not just an eternal generation through his divine uh, through his divine generation from the Father. That's really fascinating. So he's focusing on the virgin birth and Christ's humanity in the incarnation and saying that that is what is going on in Isaiah 53. And of course, we know the incarnation is central to the cross and the work of Jesus on the cross. Notice what uh, Justin Martyr then says. His generation would take place for men at the time when they would become acquainted with him. And then he quotes the psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So he sees Christ's revelation as man to man as a generation. So he's focusing on his, his um, the generation that began in time and space and will continue hypostatically uh, uh, as God and man forever and ever. So this was all part of the Logos theology of Justin Martyr. And I'm not going to go into that, but it's uh, if you're interested in the study, it's called Logos theology. Uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon was the next one. Uh, this holy man of God says, for that according to John relates his original, effectual, and glorious generation from the Father, thus declaring, in the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with God and the word was God. So he quotes John chapter one, and he applies the word generation with reference to Jesus, speaking of his eternal generation from the father. Okay, now he doesn't call it eternal generation. Um, he believed in apostolic doctrine, so he believed in the eternal generation, but he doesn't focus on the eternal aspect. But clearly he's speaking of Jesus, the second person uh, of God, uh, eternally being generated from the father. So he's focusing on Christ's divinity. In, uh, in Irenaeus's writings. He says uh, later, in Matthew 2, recognizing one and the same Jesus Christ, exhibiting his generation as a man from the virgin, quoting the psalm, even as God did promise David that he would raise up from the fruit of his body an eternal king, having made the same promise to Abraham a long time previously, says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Now, why do I include this? And I'll tell you why. Because the preterist argument, they will say that this generation, that the word genea for generation in the Gospel of Matthew is, is focused on its temporal aspect, that the limited time of 30, 40 years. And they will actually go to Matthew chapter 1 to demonstrate that as their proof text, usually. They'll say, look, these are the generations from David going on from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. Clearly, these are temporal or time-limited generations. Not so. They also, as are all the references, um, to my knowledge, of Ganea throughout the new and perhaps the old, focus on father, son coming forth from and not do not have that temporal force. OK, so it's interesting that Irenaeus also agrees with that us on that. And he uses Matthew chapter one, verse one to demonstrate it. Then he says, and how shall he, that is man, escape from the generation subject to death? That's this generation in Adam. If not by means of a new generation, what is that? That's regeneration, right? That's the spirit's birth from above, given in a wonderful and unexpected manner, but as a sign of salvation by God, that regeneration, there it is, which flows from the virgin through faith, or how shall they receive adoption from God if they remain in this generation, which is? Okay, so he's talking about two separate generations, the original generation from Adam after the fall, and then the regeneration necessary to receive the kingdom of God. Now, one qualification, when he says that regeneration flows from the virgin, this is not to be confused with the Roman, the much later Roman Catholic idea of Mary as the co-redemptrix, or Mary is somehow giving direct grace and salvation to man. That's not what Irenaeus has in mind. Irenaeus is simply saying that it's through the virgin that Jesus came. Jesus is our salvation. He's the dispenser of grace. He came through Mary as a, uh, and was begotten um, from God through the Holy Spirit from, um, to the Virgin Mary. So secondarily through Mary, salvation has come to the world. Okay, so it's a secondary sense, not a primary grace. Okay, so don't get confused. He's not arguing for a Roman Catholic teaching here. Okay, um, and how does it happen? The regeneration happens through faith, he says. All right, Clement of Alexandria, um, our dear brother and saint says, and the generation of those that seek him, quoting Psalm 24, is the elect race devoted to inquiry after knowledge. Again, he's using the word race here, not as an ethnic term, but a spiritual race, a people, a, a spiritual generation. He's talking about the church, right? The generation of those that seek him. And of course, this has application to the Jewish nation at the time of the end as well. Um, we know from the, the larger panoply of scripture. Tertullian, although he and Origen of Alexandria both uh, adopted different forms of heresy in their teaching, uh, they had a lot of good things to say, which were instrumental for the early nascent church. And so I include them here just for our edification. And these are uh, good teachings that they, that they held to at one point. Tertullian says, a corrupt tree will never yield good fruit. There's, there's Christ's words. Unless the better nature be grafted into it. That's regeneration. Nor will a good tree produce evil fruit except by the same process of cultivation. Stones also will become children of Abraham if educated in Abraham's faith. And a generation of vipers will bring forth the fruits of penitence if they reject the poison of their malignant nature. This will be the power of the grace of God. Amen. Origen of Alexandria said um, of the only begotten son, Christ, he said his generation is as eternal and everlasting as the brilliancy which is produced from the sun, for it is not by receiving the breath of life that he has made a son, but by an outward act, but by his own nature. So he's contrasting 
the generation, the eternal generation of Christ with the regeneration that you and I received. Jesus didn't need to be regenerated because he was constantly generated from the Father throughout all, all eternity. We need regeneration because we have received the generation of the serpent and we need to be born again. Christ did not need to be born again. So the meaning of Christ's statement, right? This is what we started with. We need to find our way there. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And so we must ask again, who is this generation? And what are all these things that must take place? I want to drive home the point that all these things is an eschatological term. We already saw how it was used in I believe it was uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, just before the Song of Moses, that all these things refers to the covenantal blessings and the curse that the nation would receive. That has an eschatological uh, meaning. But now here we're going to see it in Daniel as well. Okay. In Daniel, the vision of Daniel 10 through 12, uh, we learn that it's about the time of the end. That's very explicit in the text. We see this in verses 4, 9, and 13. It tells us three times that the vision's about the time of the end or the end of uh, the time of the end, or the end. Um, okay. So anyhow, uh, the man clothed in linen, which I believe to be the pre-incarnate Jesus, okay, but others would say this is an angel, but that's um, neither here nor there for our purposes here. The man clothed in linen described the unprecedented tribulation and the resurrection of the dead in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 12. Okay, so again, we see the same thing that Jesus talked about, right? Because Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation, right? In verse Matthew 24, 15, Daniel in chapter 11, in the same vision, just talked about the abomination of desolation in verses, what is it? Um, 30, what is it? 32 and following, I think. Um, but anyway, he talks about the abomination of desolation and he follows it up with a explicit reference to the tribulation, the great, the, the great tribulation in uh, the first three verses, and speaks of the res the tribulation ending and the resurrection of the dead. Okay, and he describes the resurrection of, of of the dead, and then he says, by the way, Jesus also described the gathering of God's elect and the in the coming of the Son of Man. So, what do you think he has in mind? Because scholars across the boards on almost every persuasion agree with us that Jesus was providing a homily or an exposition, if you will, of this revelation of Daniel in Daniel chapters 11 and 12. And so Jesus is speaking, I would argue, and can demonstrate that Jesus is speaking of the same events that Daniel is. And notice what he says. He says, how long should the fulfillment of these wonders be? In other words, when will these things take place? The exact same thing that the apostles asked Jesus on the Mount of Olives that led into the Olivet Discourse. And then the man swore that the vision will be fulfilled during, quote, a time, times, and half a time, which we know, I won't go into it, from other passage, both in Revelation and in Daniel, is three and a half years, 42 months, okay? That it will be fulfilled during that period. And when the power, check this out, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, what? All these things shall be finished. That's the same language we see in Matthew 23 and 24. All what things? All the things he just talked about. What's that? The the abomination, the, the great tribulation, and the deliverance of Daniel's people, the Jewish people, and the holy people of God, and the resurrection of the dead. All these things will be finished. It's the same thing that Jesus said when he said, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Amen? Daniel's puzzled. He says, although I heard, I did not understand. And then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Hearkening back to verse the previous verse. Then the man answered that the setting up of the abomination of desolation and the removal of the daily sacrifice will occur three and a half years before the resurrection. And then Daniel himself will rise up and receive his inheritance after having been asleep for a long time. Okay. In other words, this is going to be a long period before this three and a half years. So Daniel, you're going to die and it's going to happen a long time later. And that's exactly the point Jesus is hinting at. And it will become explicit after Pentecost to the apostles. So Dan, the point is Daniel is speaking of the same eschatological period as Moses and Jesus. Uh, we see the same things. 
Notice that the man swore that the vision will be fulfilled during a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Reggie touched on this as well. The power of the Jewish people, the power of the holy people of God, those who are elect unto salvation, okay, will be completely shattered. Clearly, Daniel has in mind the Jewish nation in his context, and that is strengthened by what Moses said. You ready for this? In the song of Moses, what does he say? For the Lord will judge his people and he will have compassion on his servants. That's the language of Deuteronomy 30 at the time of the end when they receive the spiritual circumcision as a nation. Okay. And he will have compassion on his servants when? When he sees that their power is gone. Okay, in the tribulation, the tribulation isn't arbitrary. It's meant to bring salvation by pressing in the people of God, by hedging them in, by crushing their reliance on self and the pride of presumption and the pride of wisdom and riches and power and fame. He's destroying all things so that Christ alone will be glorified in that day. So what has to happen? Just like you and I, our power had to be defeated for the grace of Christ to show up. The nation themselves, the nation itself, their power will have to be gone for the glory of Christ to show up. And guess what? Guess who comes? A savior from heaven. And then all these things shall be finished, Daniel says. Moses said the same thing. He'll have compassion on the nation. He will bring them in. They will inherit the land forever. It's the same as catalogical meaning. So what is this mystery that God is, is hedging us in? There is a deliberate versatility of, of application in the language this generation. Why? Because it leaves open the possibility that Christ's original audience could be there to witness the returning Lord. It opens up the possibility. The language does. The disciples did not know the day or the hour. We don't know the day or the hour, although we see the things approaching oh so ever closely. But Christ reminds us that it will not happen until when all these things take place. The destruction of the temple, yes. The tribulation, yes. But that generation that saw the destruction of the second temple almost certainly thought that Christ would return. And you know what they did? They listened to Jesus's words, and he said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And Eusebius, um, St. Eusebius of Caesarea tells us, I think he was a saint, in, in the ecclesiastical history of the church, he says that the saints of Judea and Jerusalem, they fled. They went to Jordan. They went to the mountains, just like Jesus said. And they were delivered because of it. And they became the nucleus of, of, of many of the, the early parishes of the, of the church. But so in by way of application, there was application with the destruction of the second temple, but it holds out for all these things. Jesus says, don't be dismayed. These are just the beginning of the birth pains. Even the second temple is going to come and go. But you know what? Christ doesn't part the sky until this generation passes away. They will continue to persecute you. They will continue to... Uh, to, to mistreat you in their synagogues and before governors and before kings, and you will have an opportunity with boldness of speech to proclaim the gospel to all the nations, and only then will the end come. Only then will the end come. And so it opens the initial, his language opens the initial possibility that his original audience could have seen his glorious return because they did not know the timing of these things. So there's a semantic versatility of application, okay? However, the destruction of the second temple was typological, and it was a prophetic foreshadowing. It was a partial, but not an exhaustive and plenary fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse. It's just not. Just like the days of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the first temple, or Antiochus's profaning uh, in the second century BC of the temple under the, under the Hellen Hellenized period. Those um, are all prophetic foreshadowings of the final day. And I think our brother mentioned earlier in this in this series about uh, um, Nazi Germany, right? So we've got another prophetic foreshadowing. But the final Antichrist will be associated with the final ingrafting, um, the final pressing in that will bring Israel out of the tribulation, uh, those who survive and unto glory as a nu the nucleus of the new nation, um, which will also include those through faith who are of the nations, okay? So um, this present evil age, this wicked generation will continue to persecute and harass the people of God until they are put asunder under Christ's feet, finally and fully at the day of the Lord, when the sun turns to darkness, the moons turn to blood, and we see Christ Jesus coming in the glory of his father. 
and then all these things will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but rest assured, my words will never pass away. And of course, Jesus is looking back to Isaiah, um, the last part of Isaiah there. So this phrase that we've looked at all day today, it sets us up. It stumbles academic presumption. It stumbles the, the preterists. It stumbles um, the, um, the religious traditional uh, sects of Judaism. It stumbles uh, the atheists. It's, if you're looking for an excuse, this verse will give it to you. But if you're looking for the truth and you're hedged in by the testimony of Scripture and by the voice of the Holy Spirit, you can learn, um, God willing, through the humility that comes through the Spirit, you will learn that this generation is speaking about not a time period or all those living in Jesus's day, but it's speaking of a trans-historical spiritual offspring that goes back to the beginning. And then what happens? I'm going to finish with this. When Christ returns, the wicked, he says in the Olivet Discourse, are taken, they're swept away like the flood in Noah's day, which we've seen in Genesis 7-1. They're put into hell, hellfire and brimstone, eternal destruction, shut out from the marriage feast, cast out into outer darkness, and the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We come into the marriage supper. We go out to meet the lamb. We're placed in positions of authority where there is utter, utter joy with our master. We inherit the kingdom and we have eternal life. So that great ingathering of the saints out from this generation will be completed at the day of Christ Jesus. Um, it's been my privilege to share this with you today. I hope it's been instructive. I hope it wasn't too much and burdensome to you, but I hope that it was. Um, I hope that it was um, a blessing. And uh, it, it's up to Adam. Uh, it, whether or not we want to open it up for questions, but I'm, I'm more than happy to do that or not as, as your needs arise. But uh, thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. Yeah, a couple of thoughts, Brock. Uh, um, if, before opening it for questions, I want to smuggle a couple of things in, Brock. Absolutely. I'd appreciate precious, that. Precious apologetic. What a what a gift to the church, the body of Christ. Uh, such a, a passage that's been so exploited, really, against the faith um, by our Jewish counterparts and by atheists alike. Was But one of Bertrand Russell's favorite verses mm -hmm. uh, showed Jesus was a completely false prophet, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but no, back to the point. It, uh, don't you find it curious? I think we've talked about this. I certainly see it as significant. I think you agree that Jesus would say, just after he says this generation will not pass away, as though knowing and recognizing the versatility and dual application of that, that he, had, he continues by saying, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. As though, let my sheep look a little closer. Let them bend in a little further. Be a little more observant. Could it be that the Son of God has committed himself and all these things to a, to a single 40-year generation? Or is this rather a continuum of an abiding disposition that has plagued the Jewish people ever since Moses said, I believe from Mount uh, Nebo, he said, for unto this day the Lord has not given you a heart to, to, to understand, eyes to see, or ears to hear. But the day is coming at the end of a great tribulation in the latter days when you will have your heart circumcised. And then not only you, but your children after you will have this land. So now the gen so, so now there's a the Lord has appended the very imperishableness of the heavens and earth. No, rather saying that they will pass away, but be sure my words will not pass away. As though to punctuate that and to give pause of this haste with which men take the term generation and just assume it can only mean a little pocket of time with his, with his contemporary situation. But rather, we're looking at a continuum of an abiding disposition of, like, like Stephen says, as your fathers did, so do you always resist the Holy Spirit. But we all know, we who are premillennial in our persuasion, we know the day is coming when one thing's true of that coming generation uh, throughout the whole of the thousand years, there will never be an occasion to say to the neighbor, know the Lord. We will, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Meaning this generation is gone. 
It is passed away. For now we have an all holy, all righteous Jewish nation and all their children after them, able to preserve themselves now forever in the land. Now, that's one point. The other point is this. Um, you're aware, of course, that Jesus is called the Prince of Hosts. We say Jesus, but this, of course, is the pre-incarnate angel of the Lord's presence. Because remember, the word angel doesn't necessarily mean a created being. It's a, it's a messenger. Mm -hmm. And we know that sometimes the Lord himself has been that messenger right. in his, in his uh, approach to Abraham in what Amory, what's whatever the, the place was. Uh, the two the two men and all throughout you know the, the parents of samson so the the angel of the lord's presence this angel in whom the very name of the lord is in that angel we know to be a nun created but he's also a mediating messenger at many junctures throughout redemptive history so in the book of daniel he's presented as uh the prince of the host this is the head of the angel armies so to speak right and we know also there's another ultimate Prince, um, the the Satan, and uh, both of these two heavenly beings in their heavenly capacity have got to come into an incarnation. Messiah, the Prince, is the incarnation of the heavenly Prince of Princes, and so also Satan, who is the head of the fallen host, right? That is always opposing the covenant, opposing the people of God. He must also come to his appointed. Resurrection. This is the two generations, the generation of the godly and the ungodly, which represent two pol a polarity of natures. You know, it says the children of the flesh did always persecute the child of the spirit. So there's always a, a those destitute of the spirit, the children of the flesh, and they persecuted the seed or the line who had the divine nature, who were alive to God by, by, by the righteousness of faith. And they were the objects of this persecution. So we have these two lines, and you'll agree that they represent a nature, mm -hmm. the nature of the godly and the ungodly. And that nature is none other than the nature of Christ. It's Christ who is in them. He is that one and only source of all true life. He's the divine nature that one must either be a partaker of or perish. Yeah. And so we, we talked about that. But help me here, because we want to talk about just a second before we let you go, about these two mysteries of, of the serpent, a corporate seed, mm -hmm. and both of these coming to a climactic culmination of incarnation mm -hmm. in an individual, in a human. So Paul says, we are waiting, and 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, we are waiting for the mystery of lawlessness mm -hmm. to be revealed. And if this mystery, which is present and ongoing, transhistorical, come to, comes to its climactic head, climax in a man, the number of a man. So this is an individual who fills up a fullness of an incarnate fullness and expression, like Jesus was the express image, and he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily in whom all fullness was pleased to dwell, right? So uh, antithetically, this final prince will be the head of that race of this generation, that generation. He will be the climactic head. Speak to that, Rob. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that we see the intertwining of those two seeds from Genesis 3.15, or even before that, right, uh, in, the, in the narrative itself, all the way to the destruction of the final Antichrist. So we see the corporate, we see the corporate seeds um, waging warfare against one another, a spiritual battle. We see the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, um, the seed of the woman, of course, being those who are in Christ, whether Old Testament or New Testament saints, those that have the gospel, have the, have the spirit, have the circumcised heart, uh, waging a spiritual warfare against the children of this age, this world. And that doesn't spring from the original creation that God made, because he created man very good. Man was not created with the proclivity for iniquity, but of, of man's own volition and free will, unmarred and un, un, un uh, Inter, without any um, internal interference, at least, uh, of wickedness, chose iniquity. And as a result of that, the serpent was able to then externally become um, tethered to man. And so um, we all are born as part of, I believe, a part of this generation and are only by the grace of Christ brought out to be no longer a part of this generation, Christ being the only exception, having never been a part of this generation, always being from the Father. We become from the Father, of course, through generation, re regeneration. Mm -hmm. And so 
but we still have within our heart a battle that takes place, right? We are constantly walking, uh, walking out through love, the deeds of Christ, Christ in us, right? It's not our works. It comes through from grace. Otherwise it's, it's a um, wood, hay and stubble. I mean, it's meaningless or damaging even um, if it's done for iniquity, but Christ in us, we are working out the generation that's eternal that comes from Christ himself. So only by participating in the divine nature, participating in the life of Christ himself by the spirit through grace, are we able to even be children of God? Otherwise we're still part of this generation, right? So we're, so the gospel pro- proclamation is to call us out so that we're no longer on this side of the fence. We're on this side of the fence in this great warfare. And so this is the great cosmic warfare that Daniel speaks to, I think, when he talks about the great conflict, right? And then he gives us this final vision in Daniel, where it's not just about the Antichrist and all that. That's the that's the culmination, the denouement of the whole thing. Really, the central piece is the cross. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's the, that's the everlasting gospel. That's the heart of it. And it's because of the cross that when Christ returns, he puts asunder the man uh, of lawlessness. But yeah, the man of righteousness and the man of lawlessness in their humanity are the fullness of of these two mysteries, the mystery of wickedness on the one hand and the mystery of righteousness on the other. And of course, we know who wins at the end of the story, right? The man of sin is defeated, uh, Isaiah 11, 4 and, and uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. And 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, I would encourage everybody, spend a lot of time in that. That is a major passage. It's sort of the, it's almost the key to unlocking eschatology, uh, certainly right. as it pertains to the end times. And it deals with this. And also, as you were speaking, Reggie, a verse that came to mind is, is um, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, uh, the Apostle John tells us, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of demons performing signs and on and on to, to gather them to the day of the great day of God, the Almighty. But there is almost every commentator, regardless of persuasion, sees the nuance of that, that there is an unholy trinity in mm-hmm. Satan, the serpent, right? And his incarnation, this Leviathan incarnation in the Antichrist and the false prophet. He sees an unholy trinity that's antithetical to the trinity of God. So the even the trinity itself has its its parody, its counterpart in iniquity. Now, we're not arguing for a um, a, um, a, a true dichotomy like we see in um, Manichaeanism or, you know, some of the Persian religions. We're not talking about that. We know that the devil is the arch enemy of God, but God has all power over the enemy and all of his minions. Always has, always will. There's no, there's no comparison ontologically or in power and authority. There's no comparison. But as it pertains to the struggle of man, we see a, a, a cosmic battle that only finds its fulfillment on the day of Christ Jesus. Does that, does that answer your question, Reg, or does it answer your kind of thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting then that uh, the, the famous prophecy of the 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, is constructed or framed around, the, around these two great moments of incarnation. So Paul tells us Jesus can't come back until this last climactic incarnation, because whereas the seed of the woman has come and brought in everlasting righteousness, one yet remains. Uh, and this, when this mystery will be fulfilled in this final embodiment of our incarnation of, of Satan, and there's a lot to this, but that's not the point of today, but then and only then can Jesus return. So we're looking at a 70 years. So this argues for the fact necessarily then that the 70th week is, is held in abeyance. It's reserved until the coming in of this final man of sin to fulfill this final mystery of lawlessness. Absolutely. And so not only did all the prophets, were you done, Reggie? I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Not only did all the prophets speak about the coming Messiah and his work and his ministry and um, his death and resurrection for sure, but they also all spoke of the day of the Lord, the final, the final end where he would put us under iniquity in this, this particular man. And Ezekiel tells us that this chief prince Gog, which we know to clearly to be the Antichrist, he said, this is he of whom all the prophets spoke. Yeah. So that chief enemy of God is also in all the prophets. We may not see it because we may not have eyes to see it or we may not take the time to look for it. But, but this intertwining of this great cosmic battle between the two seeds, both in its 
in its collective and individual form is all, all throughout the scriptures. Yeah, is Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, the great principalities behind these, these notable contemporary kings became the paradigm of this final aggressor, waiting for the return of the Son of Man who, from heaven to where he ascended after he, after, the, after he was cut off. Okay, now, do you have a few minutes for a couple I, of questions? I actually do. Thanks. Yes. Oh, do you, praise the Lord. We were, we were concerned about that. So uh, let's see uh, around the room. Does anyone have a, a burning question relevant to the topic? <laughs> relevant. <laughs> wow. Hello. There you go. Hello. Hello. Um, for the message. Um, my name is Wes. I've got a couple of questions about how to apply this teaching as a way to make sure that I'm understanding it. Um, one, since um, this generation will not pass away, um, one application that comes to mind is we'll always have someone to witness to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that seems to be. And then the second application that I'm a little bit shakier on is as the battle between the two corporate seeds, between the church and the unsaved, we'll just say, um, intensifies. And as the church is losing its power, I can't remember exactly how you said it. I mean, it's dwindling in its you know influence and so forth until it gets down to nothing. We shouldn't hope for any respite. I mean, we it's a challenge to endure because our respite is not until Christ comes. You know, we're going to continue to be in a quote unquote losing battle, at least percep perception wise, you know, until the end. It, it, am I understanding that correctly? Um, in part, I think. Uh, the qualification I think that I would add is that, in one sense, when we talk about the shattering of power, you know, the presupposition, the, the presumption of pride and the, the strength of the flesh, right? Trusting in oneself instead of Christ, which is something all Christians struggle with. On a daily basis, that that struggle is the internal cosmic struggle of that also has its reflection in the angelic hosts who are waging war with one another. Right. So in the sense that this this battle will continue in our daily lives by way of application until the end. Yes. And, and there is a sense in which it seems like we're fighting a losing battle. Right. Because we're seeing um, I mean, especially in our day, as things really heat up and we're seeing I think the beginning truly in a real sense of the beginning of some major birth pains that are going to give way. I think the dam is going to give way soon and we're going to see some of this, the revelation of this man of sin and the things that lead up to it. It seems like we're losing, right? Because we're, we're dying daily, the apostle says. So there, there, we are being persecuted. It is hard to speak out at work. And then, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, to, to spend time with our kids when we could read the paper, you know, and on and on and on. So there is that. But I think what I would suggest is that we're winning because the gospel is advancing. There are, um, it is continuing to go forth to all the nations. There is a, a witness that is continuing. We may not always see it. We may not always certainly see it in our own lives, especially if we feel defeated um, that particular day or what have you. But as the day approaches, the saints will be lit up. I mean, there is going to be a revelation of power, a latter rain, a, not in the the sense that some, some people use that phrase, but there's going to be a uh, continuation of Pentecostal power that I believe from scripture will intensify and become even more of a boldness of speech. Why? Because when our power is being reduced, what happens when your power is being reduced? You have a choice, right? You're either going to rely on, you're going to look to your, to the storm around you and the sinking that you're feeling, right? Or you're at some point, if you're a child of God, hopefully you turn your gaze towards the one that says, walk on the water, right? Trust me, not because you're walking, but because you're looking at me, right? So I think as we are broken and beat down and, and impressed and everything, um, we don't despair because that glory shines forth more and more as we're being broken, you know, like the jars of clay that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. So I, I don't look at it as a, as a negative eschatology, to use the phrase that we're uh, labeled with. I look at it as... Um, it's truly a victorious eschatology to use the post, you know, the phrase the post millennialists like to throw around. But I don't know if I answered your question. If not, um, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, just to say, ultimately, the Jewish people are in particular, are particularly, um, just, we've got some audio here. They're the ones that are 
toward the very end of the tribulation, their power is now coming to an end. The attrition of the tribulation has broken them like Jacob was emptied of his power as the Lord wrestled with him. That's the great analogy. So they're coming to the end of their power, which is their own self-reliance, their own resourcefulness, like Jacob had his name. So they're coming to the time of the great transition when a nation will be born spiritually, resurrected spiritually in one day. But the church will have already come through its only, it's, it's a prophetic people. And they know this tribulation is coming, and they're being deeply exercised by what they see coming. And, and, the, and the scripture quite indicates, we'll talk about this tomorrow, that the body of Christ will be in a kind of Daniel-like posture of travail and intercession, and will have a great breakthrough towards the middle of the week. A lot of things there are going on that was going to give them great power, along with the two witnesses for that last 42 months. That's not just a power with the two witnesses. That's going to be the corporate people of God. Those are his true sheep. While many will fall away, the true sheep of God will come forth into a, an anointing that will be incredible. They will love not their lives to the death. But all the way until that time, we are under a time of, of being weakened, straightened, or crowded by the Lord to a deeper and deeper dependency upon him. But during that time, the Lord is quite as free and liberal to give revival. Revival is an ever-present possibility and potential whenever God's people will pray. And even in the worst of times, they can be the best of times. And remember this, there remains a rest for the people of God. Right. We're to approach these days from a place of rest, mm -hmm. of, 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 of a confidence in Christ that uh, though we're killed all the day long, we're being renewed day by day. Right. So it's yeah. a very positive reality. So, yeah. This is just this is going to reaffirm what Reggie said, but the strength of the holy people reference to the Jews foremost. But we, as as a parallel, um, we got to go through that to an extent too. And just like Reggie said, also the rest; those who are brought to the rest first. It's no longer going to be a spiritual battle only, just like Satan's going to descend and, and come in human flesh. He has nothing in you when you enter that rest. So the only thing he could do to stop the damage that you're doing to his kingdom is to attack you in a human form, in a human way, to put you to death, just like Stephen. I would say that Stephen was sorely tested for a period of time by circumstances through demonic forces, manipulating people and stuff. But when it, when it was recognized that there's, he sold out, it's absolute surrender. He sold out. There's no, there's no cracks in his armor. There's nothing we can do. we got to silence this guy. And that's when he was executed. Um, you, you see in Revelation, Satan's been given power to overcome the saints, and many are executed. But their, their robes are, are purified and washed through that, that final experience. Mm -hmm. And um, the Jewish people that are going to observe us in that crucifix, they're going to recognize those that have no fear, that have already been sold out, and eventually they're going to be you know, displayed through execution, sometimes on their behalf, but they're going to see that, and it's going to arrest their attention. This is something different. This is, you know, like like Saul when he watched Stephen being executed. I don't, I don't want to say much more because it uh, looks like maybe tomorrow the future um, sessions are going to bring more out. But it's it's just been a a warm flood from heaven with with the food that we've been served. And I'm talking manna. It's, it's, just, it's just a warm overflowing from the King of Kings. It's, we're having a banquet in the courthouse and he's in charge and he's given us liberty to relax and enjoy in his presence. And I, I want to thank him first. And um, 
Thank you, brother. That's that's good. I, um, you know, of course, I'm always blessed by your presence at the conferences. <laughs> I have to admit, um, and and the humility in which you come forth. But I, I, um, I'm jealous with a godly jealousy that you all are there. I wish, I wish so much I could be there. Um, I there's something I did want to mention. Reggie was talking about the, co- you know, back to this cosmic struggle, just real quick. Something before I fail to mention it. You know, within our ourselves our heart is the holy place, the most holy place, right? We, there is some allusion to that in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we are to give Christ, uh, Christ to take place in our hearts, in, in the most inner man. And when we choose to uh, have any type of idolatry, any type of rebellion, uh, we give place for the man of sin to take up residence in our hearts. So we need to be very cautious that we are in fellowship with Christ, that we are walking in the spirit so that it's Christ that is in the most holy place, right? Uh, he always is, but that we not give place to the enemy to have a foothold at all, right? I mean, that sounds obvious, but our hearts are the most holy place. And uh, by way of application, uh, Satan wants that most holy place. So we ought to be, uh, be careful not to give him a foothold. We got another question. Just kind of summarizing something. Um, I was wondering, Adam's death is this generation the first death, and it and it won't pass away till death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. And just what uh, he was saying about the saints are overcome too. That's interesting, and that mm-hmm. um, I think that when they're locked into the like the mark of the beast where they're locked in and they behead the believers is there's a witness against them that they killed messiah before the judgment just those certain thoughts i had on it thank you yeah that's good and the corporate nation you know both the jews and the church um you know experience both individually and corporately experience a death and a resurrection right there has to be a death to the self there has to be a, de- a death to um, to the flesh, and there has to be a, a resurrection um, by the Spirit. All right. And oh, yeah, super what, slow. I don't care because of what Matt just said. I just didn't want to let this pass because um, I was with Art. We were on our way up to Lubbock for a ministry trip We're down in Texas, and. Uh, on the way there, the Lord just birthed something. It was so clear. And try this out, because again, for the academic minded, this will probably sound like a stretch, but for you prophetic people, I think it'll be a blessing. And that is the great paradigm, uh, a prophetic paradigm, for what the great, the great transition with the Jewish people is Paul on the road to Damascus. He was arrested by an, exp- an encounter with the, with the risen Lord. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You don't you know the story. But before that, Paul was finding it hard to kick against the goad. And we submit that that was because of what he saw with Stephen. Mm-hmm. No one but Paul would have been able to tell Luke the biography of what took place with Stephen, how his face shone. And while Paul would go on a more rabid, frenzied persecution of the Jews, basically accelerating after that, he was now a man conflicted. His categories had been deeply shaken, if not shattered, in what he saw with Stephen. This man falling under the weight of the stones, Father, for you know, almost like Jesus, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And we really, we really believe that the Lord could persuade us in that car that this was a picture of the end time body of Christ laying its life down for the Jewish people, even in their hardness and blindness, and it be, being something they could see of, of something that had cost the body of Christ, absolutely their lives. And they had exposed themselves to this great danger for their love and their embracing of a people who had little patience for the gospel. And so I believe it's a martyr witness church that's in the, that's in the form of a Stephen that's going to be the last thing the Jews will see before they see Jesus. And that's going to prepare their hearts like it prepared Paul's heart for that epiphany on the road to Damascus it's preparing the Jewish heart for when the Lord will part the sky and they won't just see him bodily. That would not regenerate the heart. They're going to see him by the spirit because of the seed 
that was planted by the Martyr Witness Church, a Stephen Martyr Witness Church, that will be giving an apologetic that will have cogency, a compelling body of evidence, like in a court of law, leaving them virtually without excuse. But so great is the is the uh, natural resistance against the gospel that it'll take, even though that seed is there, working like the proverbial uh, sand in the oyster, it will take the opening of their eyes at a single moment of time. But that's been prepared by what God has sent to them through the offense of the Gentile, that the Gentile would be giving witness to their Messiah, having been prepared, expecting the the, the calamity that's coming to them by their by their rejected prophet and Messiah. I mean, it's a divine setup. And so I hope you can appreciate that. That, Like I say, to academics, that's going to sound like, oh, boy, you're smuggling a lot in. But I believe the Lord revealed that to us, that the, that Israel will be deeply prepared for that uh, revelational moment when they will be born as a, as a nation. And one day they'll go apart to mourn and weep, you know, and rise up the nation that's going to return with songs of everlasting joy. So I, that's, a, that's what was birthed in that car. I just wanted to, you guys to hear that. I think that, um, like in Revelation 7, you, you, sh- you see this great company of martyred saints. That's, uh, that's victory. That's not the world's kind of victory, but that's God's victory. And that witness of those saints that are just, a lot of them are just coming to salvation in this transitional time. They pick up this cause, and they love not their lives unto the death right? And it's, it's just an ongoing witness. And I would even suggest, like, like uh, Reggie is suggesting, that it's because of the cause of the Jew that these guys are getting slaughtered. Uh, through church, the living body from those who are name, live by name only. And you know, there's another analogy we're built right in. We just can't miss this. The translation of Elijah what left behind was a double anointing. We're going to see a nation that's going to be a nation of Apostle Paul's. It's going to have such a love for the Gentiles. We're going to see the reconciliation of Jew and Arab falling on one another's neck. When? After Jacob's been touched to the thigh of his strength and his brother sees him coming, limping. Perfect. The whole thing is a complete drama. Joseph and his brethren. I mean, you could just go on and on drawing out the rich typology once you get this framework, this context. You know, it's one thing leads to another. <laughs> well, well, brothers, that, I hate to cut it short, but I've got to head out. My, we're headed across uh, Florida. And brother, I, thank you so much for everything, brother. Love you all. Thank yeah. you. For, let me be a part. Thank uh, you. Bro. I just want to say this last thing. The final statement of God is love wins. I just want you to just understand that. Only love could do what needs to be done. And only God's love in us could even cause us to want to do that. Amen. Mm. Well, that's a love. Yeah, we're going to, that's going to be it. Uh, that, is that a, a wrap? Thank you. Amen. We'll see you again at seven o'clock.